Welcome to this presentation on Key Knowledge 1.1. We'll be having a look at subjective and objective method, methods for measuring physical activity, the National Physical Activity Guidelines, and also sedentary behaviour and physical activity. So first up, we'll have a look at the National Physical Activity Guidelines. Um, there are a minimum for uh, recommendation for good health. So it shouldn't be something that you aspire to, it should be something that you do as a baseline. Um, they also um, have been formulated using the FIT principle, which is frequency, intensity, type and time. And they're a guide for children, youth, elderly and obese. So every single Australian can go by these guidelines. And it's important to note that they also have sedentary guidelines. So not only um, are they giving you a goal that um, you should have as a minimum amount of exercise, but you should also have a maximum amount of sedentary behaviour as well, which is sitting down and watching TV and playing on your phone and that sort of thing. So there's four different domains of physical activity. So they've identified that these are the four main areas where um, physical activity is most likely to occur. So there's leisure time, so your own um, personal time where you might choose um, to maybe go for a walk on the beach, etc. Um, at your work or your school, um, during household work or gardening, and also active transport. So there's four dimensions of physical activity, which is the FIT principle that I mentioned earlier. And that's frequency, which is the days per week that you do exercise. Intensity, which is um, low, moderate and vigorous. Time, which is the minutes per exercise session or how long you exercise for in that one time. And the type, so it could be aerobic, um, or weight bearing, or low impact. So how do you actually measure the intensity of your exercise? So you would be looking at using METs. So a MET is a metabolic equivalent, and it basically means that one MET is you sitting down quietly. So the more METs that you um, measure by, then the more intense your activity gets. So if you have a look at the table there, you've got um, low intensity, which is three METs or less. So that's walking slowly, gardening, uh, light household chores, say, doing the dishes, things like that. Then you've got moderate intensity, and that's four to six METs. And that's looking at, say, lightweight training, uh, moderate pace cycling. Um, during these activities, you should be able to um, talk to someone and not be puffed out. And then you've got vigorous intensity, and that's seven plus METs. And that's really intense exercise, such as skipping and running and boxing. Um, I would be surprised if someone was working at a vigorous intensity and had the ability to talk at the same time um, because they would be quite puffed and using a lot of energy just to focus on that exercise, not in anything else. Okay, so these are the National Physical Activity Guidelines summed up for you. You've got children, um, youth, adult and the obese. I've left out the elderly only because the guidelines for elderly are, are less prescriptive and guidelines for elderly basically say that they should aim to do exercise in as many ways as possible um, and for as many days as they can. But you'll notice on there as well that um, the frequency is nearly every day for each of those age groups. And if you look at the adult, it says minimum of five days, but that keyword there is minimum. So basically everyone should be exercising every day. It just depends on the amount that's required. So young children, for example, need at least three hours of activity every single day. Um, whereas adults, you know, they've, they've toned it down and made it a bit more realistic where it should be 30 minutes a day. And also on the last column there is sedentary guidelines. So the EM stands for electronic media and children that are two years and under should not be playing with um, electronic media at all. So electronic media is TV, um, DVDs, video games, iPads, um, tablets, iPods, phones, all that sort of thing. Um, there should also be only a maximum of two hours for children and youth. 
then adults, there should also be a maximum of two hours. Now, this does not include educational. So, for example, if um, a child needs to do homework and it's research on the internet, for example, then that's not included in that two hours because it's not something that's um, seen to be a leisurely activity. It's something that's a requirement. Okay, so we'll have a look at how we actually measure um, activity. So you've got subjective and objective. So subjective measures are when someone has to actually remember what they did. And it's things where they actually have to self-report or they have to recall their activities for the day. So things like diaries, um, where they write down you know, at the end of the week what they've done, um, questionnaires, they could answer questions in um, a quiz of some sort that's been given to them by a researcher. Um, a log would be, you know, a, a daily rundown of everything that they've done, those sorts of things. So they have to actually remember what they've done. Now, the thing with subjective, and it's really, really good, is it's usually non-reactive. So um, reactivity um, means that it will actually cause a reaction in the exercise behavior. So you having to fill out a log or a diary about how much exercise you've done will probably not force you to increase your exercise regime all that much. Whereas if we look at objective measures, they are usually quite reactive. So they're usually an observation or a tool that takes a direct measure. Um, an example could be an accelerometer, pedometer, heart rate monitor, or direct observation. So the first three there are tools that the person will actually wear. And so when you're wearing those tools, you're more likely to um, be aware of them and you're more likely to in increase your activity levels. So that's why it's usually reactive. The direct observation is someone actually sitting on the sidelines of your game or um, of your sport class and watching how much activity people do. So again, there's that person there to sort of stimulate you and make you think, oh, I should be doing a bit more activity. So the subjective measures um, that we usually look at are diaries and logs, recall, interviews, and a proxy report. So we'll quickly go through a description of each of them. So diaries and logs are where a person keeps a personal record of their um, daily activities in terms of physical activity. Um, it's fairly accurate. And the great thing is that it measures all of the FIT principles. So you, if you want to get an accurate picture of whether someone is meeting the MPAGs, you want them to be able to measure all of the FIT principles. So frequency, intensity, type and time. So diaries are excellent for this. It's low cost, which is really good as well. Um, but you really only can run this with a small group size. I mean, you don't want to do a research project where you've given a diary or a log to a thousand people because you simply can't read that much data. And the age range is 10 years and up. Okay, so recall. So the accuracy is low. So the reason for this is people struggle to remember, um, say, at the end of the month, how much activity they've done, or even at the end of the week. And if it was me, I'd probably struggle to remember at the end of the day. But again, the good thing is that it does um, take into account all of the FIT principle again. There's nothing stopping someone from recording everything about their frequency, intensity, type and time. Again, the cost is low. And this time you can actually have a large group size because it might um, not be something that's intensely written, such as a diary. It may only be quite short. And again, the age range is only 10 years and over. And the reason for this is someone under 10 is not considered... Um, literate enough to actually be able to write a detailed description of activity that they've done. Okay, the next type of subjective um, measure is an interview. So these can be done over the phone or in, in person. And the accuracy is fairly moderate. Um, I mean, it takes place as part of a conversation. So someone could talk themselves up 
a little bit and um, color in their physical activity levels. Um, but it still is fairly moderate. You're not going to get someone who does no activity and then go ahead and say that they've exercised every single day of the week. Um, again, it covers all of the FIT principle, but it is very high. And the reason for this is because you have to pay the person to run the interview in the first place. You can get away with a moderate group size with this um, because the conversation may only have to take five or ten minutes. And the great thing about this one is you can approach all ages with an interview. It's very easy to talk to a seven-year-old about how much activity they've done because they um, are literate enough or they have enough words to actually verbally say how much activity they've done. All right, a proxy report is when someone fills out a exercise report on your behalf. So, for example, it might be that you've got a five-year-old and um, that five-year-old is part of a subject, a part of a study where um, there's a whole bunch of other five-year-olds and they can't really fill out details for themselves on forms and that sort of thing. So they get their parents to do it on their behalf. Now, the problem with that is the accuracy is quite low because whoever is filling it out may not, number one, truly know how much activity that young person has done or um, they might just like to colour it in a bit again and um, make it seem like they have done a lot of exercise when they actually haven't. The other case where a proxy report might be used is um, where someone is mentally disabled or they have a learning disability where they can't fill in the reports either. Again, good thing is FIT principle is covered and there is a low cost and you can cover a large group size with this one because it is a report. So it is just something to be filled out. And again, all age ranges can be covered because um, anyone can report on behalf of anyone else. All right, so we'll have a look at these following objective measures. So first up, uh, pedometers. So pedometers are the little square boxes that you sit on your hip, like the picture of the lady there, and they will count the amount of steps that you do. So it's, it's fairly accurate. I mean, it depends on the price that you pay for the pedometer. Sometimes cereal boxes give them out for free as a promotion, um, and they're not very accurate. So you basically get what you pay for with pedometers. Now, the FIT principle is very poorly covered. The only um, aspect of that is the type of activity, which would be just walking or running with the pedometer. So in terms of meeting the National Physical Activity Guidelines, you're never going to know what the intensity is, how often someone does exercise for, um, how long their exercise session goes for. You won't find that information out with a pedometer. So um, they're not very good for actually measuring the MPAGs. Although on the other hand, the cost is low. You can give out a lot of them for a very low price. And the data is so simple that you can approach a large group size with them. And anyone can use them. Um, they're very, very simple to use because you're basically just pressing a button and away you go. All right, heart rate monitors are the bands that you strap to your chest and then they transmit a signal from your heartbeat to the watch that sits on your wrist. Now, they're getting a lot more complex these days, but basically they really are only monitoring your heart rate. So the accuracy is quite high. Um, there's not much that can go wrong when you're measuring your heart rate because it's just that single beat that you're looking for. And the um, heart rate monitors measure just a little bit more than the pedometers. So they're looking at intensity and time. So they can measure the intensity of your workout by recording your heart rate. So obviously the higher your heart rate, the more intense the workout. And also how long you've worked out for because the watch includes a timer and that sort of thing. The cost is moderate. Um, they're not very cheap. I mean, these days, you know, you could pick up a heart rate monitor for about $90. Um, but again, you get what you pay for. So they can range from $90 to about $200, depending on what sort of qualities you're looking for in those heart rate monitors. 
and the group size again you can approach a large group size with these because it is only a tool it's not something that um, in revolve involves a lot of um, data analysis especially with the heart rate monitors that you can hook up to the computer these days it does all the analysis for you and again all age ranges can use it although I'd recommend not giving it to younger children because you know the, the bands can slip off and that sort of thing all right accelerometers so accelerometers are um, basically things that measure g-forces and tilt and um, how things are shifted up and down from left to right now they're found in all sorts of different things so these days smartphones have accelerometers in them so say for example when you play um, temple run and you can tilt your phone and things happen or you're playing a racing game on your phone and you can tilt it that's the accelerometer working so it can measure how your body moves and you'll notice there on the picture you've got um, a few different areas where accelerometers are used so you can use it um, at your wrist at your hip um, in your chest and often they put them in shoes these days for elite athletes because it measures um, where those body parts are moving in space and time so the accuracy is fairly moderate um, so there is it's a bit similar to pedometers where um, unwanted movement can also be registered so it's not 100% accurate um, and the great thing is that it can um, measure all of the fit principle so if you pay for an expensive one you can measure everything um, the cost is extremely high so you don't want to um, have to use it say on a thousand people which is then why the group size has to be so small um, but the great thing is you can use it on all age ranges and um, the good thing is that little kids you know they um, would treat it like a pedometer and it's not very invasive it's only a tiny little thing and especially if you put it on their wrist or their hip they would barely notice it's there okay direct observation now this is the only um, objective measure that includes a person so that means that a person is hired to watch a group of people usually people in say a phys ed class and they'll focus on say one or two people and measure or record on their sheets how much exercise those people do so the accuracy is extremely high and this is because um, the recorder will be looking out for particular movements and they'll have um, a certain um, template on their sheet that they just fill out and they're only only focusing on that one or two people so there's not a lot of um, distractions for them they just focus very solely on that one or two people they can also measure the entirety of the fit principle um, again that will come through the template that they use and the thing with this though is um, it's similar to the interviews where you actually need to hire a person so the cost is quite high for that again group size is small like I said you wouldn't even be measuring a group um, maximum two people and you'd usually find that you focus just on one person and again anyone can observe anyone doing activity so this would be suitable for all age ranges okay doubly labeled water is not something that comes across very often um, it's where participants will drink say a certain amount of um, water but it's two types of water according to their body weight and then they have urine samples taken every few days to see how much of that water has been lost so the data collected shows how much oxygen has actually been used and the total energy expenditure so based on the urine samples they can measure um, how much oxygen you've used and then how much energy you've actually been exerting during your exercise and the accuracy is extremely high but the problem is that it doesn't actually measure any of the fit principle so you can't tell how frequent someone's exercised how intense how intensely they've exercised what type or how long they've exercised for 
So there's really no point in using this for the general population. Doubly labelled water would be an exercise measure um, for elite athletes usually. And the cost is extremely high, so general population again can't really afford this sort of measure. You would only do it on a small group of people. Normally if it's elite athletes you might only limit it to a sporting team or just one single athlete, but you can use it on a range of ages. Okay, so when we look at um, practicality and accuracy, there is a bit of a trade-off. So as an assessment tool gets easier to use, it usually becomes less accurate. Um, likewise, if an assessment tool produces more accurate results, this trade-off is usually being less practical. So we've got on the graph here, increase in practicality versus increasing accuracy. So if we look at the top here, you've got recall surveys. So they're very low on the accuracy, but they're high in practicality. And then as we go along, we've got pedometers, accelerometers, diaries, and then direct observation. So direct observation in reverse to recall surveys is extremely accurate, but um, very impractical because it's so intense and it takes one single person to um, run that data. Um, but the choice of the measure will depend on what information you need and whether you've got a, a small or large population. So if you wanted to measure a thousand people, um, how much walking they're doing, you wouldn't use direct observation because you can't get 1000 people to record the data about that other thousand people. So you would use something like pedometers or accelerometers instead. Um, you certainly wouldn't run diaries for a large population of 500 people because there's no one who wants to read 500 diaries. Um, whereas say if you have, um, someone who you want to know exactly how intense that activity they're doing is and how frequently they're doing it, you wouldn't use a pedometer because it's not very valid and it's not very accurate. Okay, so in saying that, we've got a table here that shows which measures are appropriate for particular populations. So you've got um, the children right through to elderly and then I've included two other groups there which is disabled individuals and individuals from non-English speaking backgrounds because there is a lot of data that's still run on those populations and it's important for you to know which measures would be appropriate. So I suppose the key thing to look at is the inappropriate measures. So like I said earlier for children um, anything that involves recall and writing and diaries, you don't really use on those that are younger than 10 years because they simply don't have the skills to fill out those forms and to write. Elderly 65 plus, again recall is not the best um, measure to use because of um, possible memory loss as they're getting older from dementia and those sorts of things. Um, disabled individuals, if they're um, physically disabled, these aren't going to be an issue. It's really only if they're mentally disabled. So this um, can be an issue when it comes to remembering things. So recall again is inappropriate. And also if they've got a severe language disorder or learning disability, they're not going to be able to fill out diaries or logs either. And um, the same for individuals from non-English speaking backgrounds. If you've got someone who's running a survey and it's all in English and then they are um, giving it to people from a non-English speaking background, those people aren't going to fill out the survey because they simply won't understand the questions. So in most of those cases, either um, a proxy report or direct observation or um, pedometers are usually the best way to go. All right, so we've had a look at the MPAGs. Um, we've looked at the measures and assessment of physical activity. We've looked at objective methods versus subjective methods. And we've also had a look at practicality versus accuracy. So if you have any questions, please make sure to ask me in class or send me an email. Thanks for listening.